The Eurozone debt crisis is re-emerging once again with concerns over the sustainability of the national debts of many of the southern European states. While this poses a real risk to the euro system itself, there remains a deeper, darker challenge that threatens the Eurozone and the ECB. Today, we investigate whether the euro can actually survive and avoid bringing down the whole global economy. So let's dive on in. Now, this channel provides global macro insights for informed investing, so do consider subscribing. So the Eurozone, which consists of 19 of the 27 EU member states we can see here, is once again facing grave risks to the survival of the single currency. In this video, we will seek to answer the following three questions posed by economist Tuomas Malinen to determine whether the Eurozone Currency Union can continue to survive. Firstly, will the ECB be able to provide support for sovereign bond markets and European commercial banks through quantitative easing programs? Secondly, will national authorities accept the terms and conditions associated with bailouts? Third, will national political leaders continue to support the euro? Now, we're all familiar with the images of the eurozone debt crisis, which first reared its head back in late 2009. The peripheral Eurozone member states of Greece, Spain, Ireland, Portugal and Cyprus were unable to repay or refinance their government debt or bail out their beleaguered banks without the assistance of third party financial institutions. Enormous credit growth had taken place in many of these countries, which was encouraged by the European Central Bank. As lenders demanded increased interest rates to lend to many of the indebted nations, it forced the issue of solvency. As we've discussed in this video, the involvement of the IMF, the ECB and the European Financial Stability Facility, the EFSF, demanded that substantial domestic budgetary and fiscal responsibilities were passed over to the European Central Bank. These countries suffered severe recessions and enormous youth unemployment. We can still see the sheer scale of the national debts of these countries as a percentage of their overall GDP in this graphic. Greece with 178% of GDP and Italy with 137%. Substantial debts to be sure. The Italian economy has been crippled by the health crisis and in the midst of such staggering declines in economic output, we can expect GDP to contract significantly, thereby increasing the size of these debts relative to GDP. Moreover, the decline in tax revenues and dramatic increases in government spending will lead to further deterioration in the public finances of already weak economies. Thus, investors are increasingly demanding additional premiums to lend to such countries, and the whole issue of solvency is raised once more. Consequently, economist Daniel Lacau believes that the ECB could own 40% of Italian government bonds and 35% of Spanish ones by the end of the year. Merkel and Macron's uh, latest plan involves a 500 billion euro recovery fund designed to stimulate the worst hit EU regions. It involves the European Commission raising this money in the financial markets and would be paid back by all member states. With repayments starting in three years time, and taking four decades to repay in total. But in the eyes of most observers, this is a pathway towards even more Europe. Oh yes, never let a good crisis go to waste. And while it would benefit the southern economic states, paying it back would be a collective endeavor for the entire union. Yet this is far from set in stone with uh, frugal nations being unwilling to simply provide loans to their southern counterparts. No doubt this situation needs a resolution for Italy with a GDP of two trillion dollars is too big to fail and too big to bail for the euro to survive. Yet worryingly, Italian support for the euro appears to be waning as we can see in this chart. Meanwhile, trust in the ECB is now falling among German and Dutch citizens, as we can see in the chart below. This is important as any policy initiative requires universal approval by all Euro member states. 
given all member states have been weakened by this crisis, will there be a willingness to actually offer support to neighbours? Well, the ruling by the German Constitutional Court that the ECB's QE programme could be illegal suggests not. But a further profound risk remains for the Eurozone and for the global economy. That is a systemic banking crisis. Europe holds the largest concentration of global systemically important banks, or GSIBs, which means that the European banking crisis will go global in an instant. It's estimated that around 10% of European companies are zombies who are unable to actually service interest costs on their debt. Now the Bank for International Settlements released a study into financial crises and found that the vast majority of crises are caused within the banking sector. No real surprises there then. However, the means by which we can assess risk have been nailed down to the growth rate of debt to GDP relative to trend and the debt service ratio of the private sector. So they found it's not actually a case of absolute debt, instead the rate of growth of that debt to GDP and the cost of servicing that debt. Bearing in mind that interest rates are already at such incredibly low levels. So using data from the Bank for International Settlements, in late 2019, four Eurozone countries were at a 50-50 risk of a systemic banking crisis within three years. Now these aren't the countries we were talking about just a moment ago. Here's the list of countries uh, economist Russell Napier has highlighted for being the greatest risk of a banking crisis. Notice four of these countries are from Northern Europe, none are in Southern Europe. But in this table we can actually compare these key stats on banking sector health against those of Italy and Germany in this table. Now the issue here is how do you persuade prudent German corporations to bail out less prudent competitor firms uh, that have borrowed so heavily? And how do you tell those same German taxpayers that they bear responsibility for the bailouts? Politically, this is a really difficult task to achieve. Yet this graphic from Alastair MacLeod shows us just how vulnerable some of Europe's largest banks, such as Deutsche Bank and BNP, truly are. The ratios of shareholder equity to bank assets, that is the loans that the banks make, uh, is approaching the 24 to 1 ratio we saw with Royal Bank of Scotland back in 2008. Notice also that the American banks are in far stronger shape here. Now, while central banks globally have been able to actually help with the short-term liquidity crisis and cover staff and supplier expenses, there is nothing they can do to boost the revenues of corporations in the midst of such an incredibly severe recession. As the flood of corporate insolvencies takes place, it seems that this will result in dramatic increases in bank non-performing loans and deterioration of their asset quality. Thus just a uh, small change in asset values can serve to completely wipe out shareholder equity within these banks. So the Eurozone faces a crisis on three separate fronts here. The health crisis, the sovereign debt crisis and a potential banking sector crisis. Now to answer the questions that we posed at the start of this video, while the ECB is undertaking substantial QE there are a number of risks that are unique to their institution that we discussed previously in this video. Ultimately the ECB is likely to be unable to act as a limitless backstop. Secondly, will national authorities accept the terms and conditions associated with bailouts? Well, if you were a Greek or Italian citizen and you had just endured this sustained period of financial repression throughout the, the last decade, how much more pain would you be willing to accept? It's unlikely that the wealthier nations will lend without such guarantees. This is why we hear the cries of more Europe. Third, will national political leaders continue to support the Euro? There are real concerns that the so-called frugal four of Germany, Netherlands, Austria and Finland will oppose such a move. Debt sharing has long remained taboo among the frugal four and issuing common bonds has already been a divisive idea among EU members in the past. 
the German Central Bank previously stated that you do not confide your credit card to someone without any possibility to control his expenditures. Amidst the backdrop of Brexit and increased concern of open borders following the health crisis, uh, we may see support truly begin to wane for the Eurozone and the European project. And if the Eurozone banks fail, well, all hell breaks loose. Alternative responses considered by economist Russell Napier include the use of capital controls by countries such as Italy, which would act to store Italian bank deposits in Italian government bonds. A new version of ICE 9, as Jim Rickards referred to it. Yet Finnish economist Tuomas Malinen believes that it will take three to four trillion euros to save the euro currency union. A massive expense to be put upon taxpayers. Here he states that saving the euro requires impoverishing us all. Meanwhile, German economist Hans Olaf Henkel is calling for Italy to leave the euro and introduce a new lira currency to allow their economy to regain competitiveness once more. Such a strategy actually worked remarkably well for Iceland versus Greece's experience from 2008 onwards, as we can see here. Ultimately, as Tuomas Malinen puts it, the defining moment in the history of 200 plus currency unions is always the same, the disappearance of political will to continue to push integration through. Do let me know whether you think the euro should be saved in the comments below. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. But thanks so much for joining me and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye bye.